afternoon, everyone. Uh, next up is, what time is it? Steve Erdman, uh, and he's going to be talking about uh, penetration and uh, system hardening. All right, so um, basically, uh, I suck at speaking in front of large groups, and I consider this a large group because there's more than five people in, this, in the audience. Um, so I apologize if I'm dull and boring and not as entertaining as some of the other speeches you might have seen. Um, basically what I want to go into is that uh, a lot of the penetrations that have actually happened on corporations and even maybe on some of the computer systems that you guys have worked on, I don't know how many network engineers are here or other security experts, but um, a lot of the penetrations that have happened in corporate America or even across the world really have been directly linked back to the fact that people just don't know what to do as far as hardening a computer system. Um, there's all kinds of issues with just gaping holes in, in computer networks and computer systems. Uh, and, and basically what I want to do is today kind of go through some of the things that you should keep, keep your eyes open for. Um, I'm going to start real low, low or high level. Um, talking about some just basic topics. Um, what is malware? Um, obviously, everyone's probably heard a lot of the terms that we've talked about as far as viruses, trojans, worms, et cetera. Um, but a lot of people get them mixed up or they're, they're, not, they're not explained properly. Um, viruses, viruses uh, they basically are out there. They're created by people. Um, they're distributed across the internet, just like a lot of other, like all other malware, really. Um, and the thing about viruses, they can morph over time. They keep changing themselves. Um, and they aim to infect as many systems on the network as possible. Uh, Trojans are a bit different. They're, they're a lot like a virus. Um, but they include things like keystroke loggers, um, they, they tend to spy on users, uh, steal data, send it back to you know, whoever released it. Um, worms are pretty much you set it and forget it. They self-propagate across the entire internet um, and they carry malicious payloads to break into a system with a known vulnerability. Um, some of these known vulnerabilities that you guys have probably heard of are like the, a lot of the SQL stuff that's been going on the, uh, the last couple of years. The, um, uh, worms like that tend to really just wreak havoc across networks, uh, and they propagate extremely fast too. Rootkits are used really to clone other malware. Um, the idea of a rootkit is that you're going to put it uh, into a computer system. It doesn't have to be a Windows-based computer. Actually, the first rootkits that were built were for Unix-based machines. Um, they're they're there to to hide other. Uh, sometimes malware, sometimes not malware, because a lot of antivirus software these days actually relies on rootkit technology um, to get really low level into the system so it can monitor pre pretty much everything that's going on within the system. Uh, some, of the, some of the rootkit technology that's used in, in legal software is like alcohol 120%. Um, some of the daemon tools, and especially Kaspersky and Norton and a lot of the other antivirus software tools that are out there. Um, Backdoor programs, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. A backdoor program is really just there for a hacker to keep being able to come back over and over and over into the machine to be not detected very easily. Uh, spyware, we touched on a little bit before. Um, it can, it, its basic idea is to get into a computer system and spy on what a user is actually doing. Um, they, try, they try to track your internet usage, where you go, and the end result is trying to get information from your computer system about you, such as, you know, obviously your personal information. Um, adware, this is more of an annoyance problem than anything. You guys have probably seen a lot of stuff like uh, the, the search bars. Anybody who's worked in a, in a, a place that removes viruses and things like that, you've probably seen like 15 different bars on Internet Explorer when, you know, a client brings their computer to you. Um, and then lastly, the most important is the actual real attackers who are trying to break in for financial gains or just to you know, prove that they can do something. Um, and that's really what we're going to be spending our time on uh, as far as hardening a system properly. So what do attackers do as far as setting up a, 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 a platform to attack from? Uh, Basically, I mean, everybody's probably heard of uh, Backtrack 4. 
Backtrack 4 is really um, the easiest thing. You can just pop a CD in your hard drive, do a couple updates, and or, uh, pop a CD in your computer, uh, boot off of it, do some updates to it, and you have a, a pretty much a straightforward attack platform that you can do anything you want with. How do I correct my wireless? Uh, my wireless. It's outside the scope of this, this talk. Sorry, Dave. Questions are going to start already. Um, so here's some of the websites that you can check out if you're interested in, in finding some more of this, uh, the, the software that you can use to start uh, penetration testing. Um, I think we'll, the, the major thing that people forget to think about as far as um, you know, hardening computer systems is, is uh, the physical aspect of a computer. Um, if you're able to break into a, a company and just walk away with you know, laptops or desktops or, God forbid, walk away with an entire server, um, you've really got some major issues and it doesn't matter what kind of security you really have around your computer system. Um, unless you have some type of full disk encryption, um, your data is pretty much going to be compromised. Um, if you look at the, the, the statistics, every, everybody's getting things stolen from them, uh, whether it's iPhones or MP3 players or laptops. Um, it, it, is, it is related a bit to the economy being so bad, but um, you know people are looking to make a quick buck any way they can. So if they can steal your laptop, and whether or not they even get any information off it or not, and they can turn around and sell it for you know a couple hundred bucks on eBay or something, um, you know that's anything they can get. Somebody with a little bit more malicious intent is going to be going after your credit card information, personal information, things like that. So really. What you really want to do is, is protect your data. The easiest way to do this is most computers that are, or laptops that are getting shipped these days come with the ability to set a ATA password from the BIOS level. Uh, if you log into your BIOS, you can actually set a password to say that if, you know, every time you boot your computer, you have to enter the password to unlock the hard drive, basically. Um, the cool thing about this is you can't just pull the hard drive out and slap in another computer system or connect it you know, via USB cable or something like that to another computer because the hard drive actually stores that ATA password on the first couple sectors of the disk. So unless you have a, a micrometer or something, you know, some seriously technical equipment to actually pull that password off, um, your data is pretty secure. Um, now, the, the, the only problem with that is the data is still not encrypted. So you can still get data off the drive if you get around brute forcing that password. So you want to make the ATA password fairly lengthy as possible. Um, and then the same thing with full disk encryption. You'll want to make sure to use a, a, a really decent password so that you know, your first name just doesn't unlock all the data on your computer system. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times we actually see that. As far as full disk encryption goes, um, there's a lot of different software that's out there. Um, I know there's been a lot of controversy around any Microsoft software, but BitLocker does a fairly decent job as long as you're looking at it not a, a corporate level. Um, there's a lot of uh, attack vectors to actually get around the, the Microsoft BitLocker software. Um, and we've actually done it at Secure State as well, which is pretty cool. Um, with the proper software on a USB key, you can actually trick a user into entering their password and then it stores it on that USB key while it unlocks the computer. So if, even if it's at like a workstation or something like that, again, this goes back to physical access. If I have the ability to connect a USB drive or something to your computer system without you seeing it, it could be a key logger, it could be a USB key, it doesn't matter. Um, first and foremost is physical security. You have to make sure it's locked down. Uh, TrueCrypt is a free software package that's out there. Um, offers basically the same protection as BitLocker does. Uh, it's a little bit more secure, but still is susceptible to the same type of attacks that the BitLocker is. Um, I haven't used KeyPark, um, but again, it's free. So if you like free stuff, that's good. Uh, if you want to look into something that's uh, a little bit more costly, there's the Checkpoint PointSec for, um, for corporate. 
uh, corporate use. The, the, the idea behind this one, though, is that you need a, a, a centralized computer system with a file share so you're able to roll out the keys to the end users. Um, and then there's PGP full disk encryption, which can be done either at a corporate level with you know, the same type of setup as PointSec, or you can actually buy it just you know, one at a time per computer system. As far as uh, logical access to a computer system, after, this, after the computer's already started up and it's on the network, you know, unprotected machines and, and just base installs of really any OS can be compromised within minutes. Um, unprotected XP machines can be compromised extremely fast. Um, in fact, you don't even need to update uh, uh, Backtrack 4 for it to work properly. You can just download the newest copy of Backtrack 4 and pop, a, uh, pop an XP machine in like two minutes. Um, as Dave talked about last night in his social engineering uh, uh, presentation, um, sending phishing emails uh, is, a, is a very easy way to get people to send their information to you. Um, we do this, uh, we do social engineering tests at Secure State all the time and we have, we have it <laughs> it's a 100% success rate, and it's really scary to see the amount of information people are willing to give up if you just talk to them a little bit, and you're a little, and you're social about it, and you're, you're, you're just a, you know, you come off as a nice, nice person. People will tell you anything you want to know. Uh, anybody who uses Kazaa, BearShare, <laughs> any of those peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, um, have fun cleaning your computer. Uh, they're loaded with malware, and they propagate using that peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and again, Dave's social engineering toolkit. So what can you do about it? Um, first and foremost, education. You really need to educate your users. You really have to get them to understand that everything is a potential attack, and then that's really hard for a lot of people to understand because people are just, you know, people just want to get to Google. They want to get to, you know, Hotmail. They want to get to Gmail. They want to get to eBay. They don't care what it is. They don't care if it, if the, um, the SSL certificate doesn't, you know, doesn't work or if it's, it's broken. You know, people don't care. They'll just keep clicking OK until they get to their site so they can you know, buy whatever they want off of eBay. Um, so what you really want to do is you want to have a, a, uh, a good host-based firewall to start with. Um, I personally use Komodo. It's really cool. It offers some pr pretty decent protection. Um, the, the drawbacks with Komodo software is that you, you kind of, you really have to know the ins and outs of the operating system you're using, whether it's XP, Vista, or, or Windows 7. Um, you have to understand how the services talk to each other. You have to understand how, you know, the registry works within the computer system. Um, if you're installing a piece of software and you have Komodo installed already, Komodo is going to come up, you know, probably 10 different times during the installation saying, well, are you sure you want to make this registry edit? And you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you just keep hitting yes, you might as well not even have any firewall installed anyways. Um, besides that though, um, at the firewall level uh, for the, net, the network firewall, your, your perimeter firewalls, you really have to have really good ingress and egress filtering. Um, close down as many ports as possible. I mean, there's no need for most people to get out you know, awkward port numbers, you know. There's no need to have Windows file sharing open to the internet. If you have Windows file sharing open to the internet, you're probably going to be compromised pretty quickly, especially if you don't run patches. Um, if you do connect directly to the internet, um, you really have to make sure that you know, a lot of DSL providers or cable, cable modem providers, people who don't have um, any type of D-Link uh, wireless router or whatever in front of them, if they don't have any type of uh, firewall in front of them blocking all those ports, then that's that ingress filtering that is, you're allowing anybody to contact your computer and talk to it however they want, um, whether it's malicious intent or not. Uh, the next thing to do is you really want to make sure you have a, a pretty decent um, antivirus software. Uh, I know antivirus is really, um, there's a lot of problems with it because it's so signature based. It's, it's, there's very little heuristics that actually happens when you're, 
you know, a, a malicious file comes in and you're running an executable on your computer, um, if, that, if there isn't a signature to say, well, this, this file is a threat or this, uh, this binary is a threat, then you're going to run it and infect your computer and your antivirus software won't even find it. So, um, you know, you have to layer the security. You can't just have a, a good uh, antivirus software and then not run a firewall. Or you can't just run a firewall and not have any antivirus software. Um, if you're running something like Norton McAfee, Panda, ESET, Nod32, um, those are like the easiest antivirus software packages to get around. Um, encoding binary is just a bit different. And you can get around um, all the signatures that these antivirus software packages provide. Um, a lot of times, if you're able to hex edit a binary, you can actually take the header files out, and it will get past the, this, the exact same signatures. Um, it's amazing how easy it is to get by most antivirus software. Um, pay attention to the websites you're at. Uh, the major websites, you know, eBay or Gmail or whoever, anybody who's running um, a website with SSL certificates, if it if it doesn't show that it's a valid certificate, you might as well just shut down your computer system or at least get off, um, get off the internet for a while and then go back to that site later because there's, if there's something wrong with the site, you have no idea where you're passing your information to. And it may be something you know, as dumb as you know, a forms website where you're just talking to other people online, but if you're giving up, if you're giving up your credentials to a website then that person probably has your password to a lot of other sites. I don't know very many people who keep decent passwords and then use different passwords for every single website they log into. So if you get one password, you're probably going to get the passwords for that user's bank account and then just jump all the way across the internet, just going to every single site that these people go to and using the exact same password. And most of the time, it's the exact same username as well. Um, I can't emphasize enough patch management. Um, you really have to install all the software uh, updates on your computer as possible. And this isn't just Windows updates. Um, there's so many different updates as far as Adobe software. Uh, it's not even just Windows software. It's, it's Linux, Unix, Mac, all of them. Everybody gets updates. So if you're not installing these updates, your computer system is very prone to being attacked. Um, Again, Secure State has a 100% success rate as far as breaking in, and, and this isn't just from a social engineering standpoint. We have a 100% success rate as far as internal penetration tests as well. Um, there's one company that we've done business with and done an internal pen test that we haven't broken into. Um, the majority of it is due to patch management. Um, you know, I can't say that all the, the companies that we do work for um, aren't installing patches, but a lot of the times when we're breaking into systems, it's because there's a buffer overflow that's existed since 2007 or 2008. You know, if you're not installing patches for that long, then you've got a serious problem. Um, general hardening techniques, um, they aren't being applied either. They have services running on machines that don't really need those services running. There's no reason for, you know, a file server to be running emails, you know, on top of that. Um, you should have pretty much just one major service per machine. You know, your domain controllers shouldn't be file sharers. Your domain controllers shouldn't be email servers. Your email servers shouldn't be file sharers. Um, you know, any, any service that you have running on a major machine should be segmented off and you should have multiple, multiple machines, one, one for each service. And then poor asset management as well. There's, there's machines that we've broken into on some of these networks and the client's like, well, we don't even know what that machine is. Well, how did it get on your network? I don't know. I, I haven't seen, I've never seen this machine before on my network. I don't know how it got there. Well, we broke into it, and that's how we compromise your, your, your network. So keeping a, keeping a very good um, uh, inventory of all the systems on your network, uh, controlling your assets, controlling what machines get onto the network. I mean, what happens if, you're, if your employees come in with a laptop and plug in their home machine into the network that's totally compromised, they've got viruses, you know, just brewing inside their computer systems and they bring it into work and now your entire network's flooded with all these viruses that this, you know, this person brought in on their home laptop. You have to be able to control that stuff. 
Um, some of the, there's really good baselines from uh, CIS and NIST, and SANS as well has a lot of good uh, white papers on their website to go over. Um, they provide a lot of really, really, really detailed information. Um, they actually get down into, you know, controlling access to certain registry keys. So if you're really interested in, in locking down your computer system, um, I suggest taking a look at especially the CIS and NIST um, benchmarks. If, um, if you're bringing a new system onto the network, you know, you have your network administrators uh, building new boxes for, for employees, these, these new computer systems should really be provisioned inside a, a, a completely controlled network, completely isolated from the internal network. Um, if, if there's a compromise that's happened on the internal network, there's no reason to spread that compromise into a brand new computer system um, that, that was just built today, and then you'll have to rebuild it tomorrow, just you know, after you get the, the compromise fixed up. So in that, in that network segment of your corporate network, you should really have, uh, you know, most, most networks are, are Windows-based, so we'll just go off the standard of, um, of Windows. You should have a, a, a Windows update service running in this, this air-gap network, or this controlled segment of the network, so you can install the patches, critical updates, and, and service packs as possible before you roll this computer out to the internal network. Um, once, you're, once, you're secured, you, once you've secured the computer system and you've rolled out all the benchmarks to it, then you can get it to the user and you can set up your user on the machine. Another, another thing that you really should think about is um, I don't know about you guys, but I have a ton of passwords for different websites. Um, so I can't remember all that stuff. In fact, I don't even try anymore. So what I do is I have, I have a few passwords that I, that I, uh, I use for really strong encryption. Uh, or I, I use those for the, the encryption or the, the files that I use. Sorry. Uh, let, me, let me back up a second. If you have so many different passwords, the best thing to do really is to store them in an encrypted file. So if you have an encrypted file, there's a lot of different password programs and password managers out there. Um, and they offer really good protection of, of your passwords. Um, so what you'll want to do is just get a really strong, very long password for your encryption database of all your passwords. And then store all your passwords in there behind this, this really controlled area. <clears throat> Some of the ones that you might have heard of um, have been uh, KeyPass, Password Safe, um, Safe Password Manager, and ID Vault. Uh, they're all free software out there. Um, you can buy ones, but I mean, it, it, KeyPass and Password Safe are the most two common that, that I've seen people use. Um, I use Password Safe, and I absolutely love it. Um, you know, a, a good 25, 30 character long password to log into my password vault. And then, you know, I don't even have to worry about remembering any of their passwords. I just, you know, double click and go pretty much to log into a website or log into a server or whatever. And with, with using software like, there, like this, there's no reason why you shouldn't have different usernames and passwords for every single system that you come in contact with. Um, if you use full disk encryption, um, make sure that your password for that is extremely long. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 the minimum password length should probably be, probably be around 15 to 20 characters. Um, and, and it's, you know, a lot of people complain, you know, why do I have to have such a long password? It's so hard for me to remember. Well, how hard is it to remember your, you know, your dog's name or your, your kid's birthday? Well, it's not, not very hard. Now, I'm not saying I'm not suggesting you should use that as a password because that's probably only like five or ten, five or ten characters long. But what you can do is make a passphrase out of it. You know, you know, if you have a boat and you like boating, you know, I like being on Lake Erie or something like that, and then throw a bunch of special characters at the end. Um, you know, right there you have a password that's like 20 characters long. There's no reason you shouldn't be using passwords like that. They're easy to remember and they're easy to type in. More than anything. Uh, as far as system hardening, you really want to disable Windows file sharing. 
Um, people shouldn't be sharing files on the internal network, and you really shouldn't be doing it at home either. Um, the idea is that you want to have as much of a client server role in, in whether or not it's your home network or your, or your corporate network. The reason why is because as soon as you open Windows file sharing, there's a ton of vulnerabilities for it. I mean, you can look at Millworm or Security Focus. There are just, is just one after another, um, you know, tons of vulnerabilities out there for these, for these services. Um, so if your clients are going to the corporate file share, well, that's only one file share, or maybe you have two file shares on your, uh, file servers on your network. That's fine. But if you have every single client, you know, on a Windows network, serving files up, then you're, you're not using the corporate, you know, the, the Windows domain uh, to its fullest potential. Um, you should be setting up, uh, you know, even if you use like distributed file sharing, uh, you should really be using something like that instead. That way you don't have to worry about all the vulnerabilities that are associated with Windows file sharing. And what you can do is if you really want to get fun with it, you can take that, all the different file servers, and you can throw them behind a network segment through, um, you know, some type of uh, IPS or IDS, at least that way when people are accessing the file share, you can tell exactly where the, the you, know, you know, the, you can tell exactly what computer system or what user is requesting files. So you're able to monitor everything as well. So monitoring and logging also come into play. If you're able to put the file shares behind uh, a different network segment, um, you can also, especially if it's, if, if, if it's if you're using a uh, intrusion prevention service, any uh, p uh, potential attacks that are going to your file servers are going to be stopped immediately while passing through the the IPS. And since there isn't any file sharing on the other part of the network, then you don't have to worry about those exact same attacks going against your you know your XP machines, or your Windows you know your your other Windows machines. So. You're probably saying, well, why do I have to run a Windows server on my home network? Well, the great thing is you don't have to. What you can do is you can set up a, a Linux or a Unix server with Samba and do basically the same thing. You know, instead of having one wireless network or you know, a wireless router, you can, have, you can go to the store and just get another one at like 50 bucks. So what you're going to do is you're basically going to segment off and, and all, your, all your machines are going to be on the first, your first uh, network segment. And then you'll have your, your back end file share, so to speak, and you can just port forward all the traffic to your file server. So what this is essentially doing is you're restricting egress filter, ingress filtering, and you're providing another tier so that if an attacker does get, you know, compromises your own computer system up front, they won't be able to attack the system in the back as well. It's the idea of keeping all your data safe. Um, the, the other big thing is there's, you know, time and time again we go into different, different companies and we're constantly, seeing, um, we're constantly seeing anonymous file shares. You know, you don't even have to be registered on the network. You don't even have to have a, a username. You can just request access to a share and you're anonymously uh, authenticated to that, to that machine and you're able to get a ton of information out of, out of servers workstations, it doesn't matter. So with, with all the file shares having, um, you know, user permissions, always remember if, you know, if, if a person doesn't need access to, you know, the HR files, well, if they don't work in HR, they don't need access to those files. So you're always looking at the, the principle of least privilege. Um, you know, your common everyday user doesn't need to know the network diagrams of the entire company. So you know, lock down the user permissions there. And then again, you're going to want to, you're really going to want to, especially in a corporate network, you're going to want to make sure that all the network file shares are on a separate segment of the network monitored by a network intrusion prevention service. And as I said before, uh, your file servers shouldn't be running any extra, any extra services that aren't needed. Domain services, web services, SQL services. Um, all this stuff should be on different systems. And you should lock down each one of those individual systems, you know, to the specifications of that machine. You know, obviously you're not going to put the same 
same type of hardening techniques onto you know a SQL server that you're going to on a domain controller, and you know the same thing goes for a, you know a file share or a web server. Um, they just don't work all the same. Um, for your going back to the file shares, um, you really should have a limited amount of uh, network administrators or administrator accounts on the machine itself. And since no one's actually going to be sitting on the server and doing work every day because that's not what servers are for, um, there should be zero local user accounts. This is, this, I mean, it should be, you know, no-brainer stuff. But again, you wouldn't believe how many local user accounts we find on these machines where people have actually logged in and tried doing work. And then, if if possible, encrypt the user data within the file shares. Um, it's kind of a tedious task, and it's going. A little bit up, uh, going up in you know complexity as far as locking down file servers. But if um, if you're really worried about data, especially your HR information um, and your and your network security, network diagrams, things like that, um, all that stuff should be encrypted somehow. And again, no no anonymous file shares. And uh, kind of as I set up here. Um, as a side note, if you're buying a brand new machine, you know, a brand new Dell or Gateway or whatever, uh, and you don't build your own machines, the first thing you should do is get it home, power it on, make your backup CDs or DVDs or you know, whatever you're going to do, and then just wipe, wipe the system clean. Um, all that extra software that these, these people install, and it, it's, not, it's not just you know, Dell or Gateway or whoever, it's every single Every single company who makes systems throws unnecessary software on there. So the easiest thing to do, instead of just uninstalling one program after another, just wipe the machine and start from scratch. So I've been talking about services for a while. I don't know if you know, I don't know the, the, the general knowledge level around here, but these are some of the services that I'm talking about as far as disabling. Um, there's really no reason that you'll be burning CDs from a domain controller, so shut down the service. Um, but again, if I'm doing uh, domain level authentication, then I'm probably going to need Kerberos running. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't disable Kerberos on the domain controller, but I absolutely would on a file share, because I'm not, I'm not doing key distribution from a file share. Um, and then it doesn't matter where you're at. You shouldn't have Messenger on. That's, that's pretty much a disabled from most, most base installs these days anyways. Um, and then, you know, just the list goes on. Just disable as much as you possibly can. You, you can pretty much disable like half the services in Windows box, and it'll still run perfectly fine. Actually, it'll probably run better because it's not all that background information running as well. So believe it or not, even if you, if you disable Windows file shares um, from the control panel, the funny thing is the ports are still up and running. So the only way to do that is to get into your network card uh, properties and actually disable NetBIOS over TCP IP. That's the only thing that's going to shut down those vulnerable ports. Um, ports 137, 139, 135, 445, very susceptible ports to attack. Um, the next thing to do is disable all, all null sessions. Uh, this, is, this is one of those things that you can easily Roll out through group policies. If you're running a, a Windows network, you know at your at your corporate your corporate network, just roll out a group policy disabling null sessions. There's three different uh, GPO settings you can roll out, and it just shuts down everything. Um, most of the programs that there that have been developed these days run perfectly fine with DEP enabled. Uh, DEP is data execution prevention, and basically it tries its best to stop any, any potential attack or buffer overflow that's been posed to a service on your computer system. Um, and what DEP does is if it senses that type of attack running, it'll just shut down and stop the service and then restart it later. So um, it's a good idea to keep that en enabled. And then there's, uh, there's no reason for any any end user to be running a, a web server off their local computer system, unless you're trying to uh, play a prank on Dave at work and put mad thumbs on your computer. Um, <laughs> um, so just disable all web servers on your computer system. There's, it's just not necessary at all. 
Um, and then lock down Internet Explorer. I mean, if, for the people who still use Internet Explorer, um, it's actually still a large user base. There's still, I think the latest statistic I saw was about 60% of people still use Internet Explorer, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, IE7 and IE8 are, are pretty good. I still like them. I still use them myself. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do by, to lock them down. Um, if you go into the options, you can, just, you can just set so many different settings, especially in the, um, in the settings tab, uh, the tab first to the right, uh, when you go into that, you can turn on a lot of different security options. And then this is more like a, a user awareness idea, and the user awareness is basically saying um, when you're at a website, um, there's a lot of Firefox plugins that are pretty cool. It'll tell you exactly what version of SSH you're using. So if you're logging into a mail server with SSH version, I'm sorry, SSL version one or version two, those are susceptible to different types of attack. And Gary's actually wrote a bunch of different blogs, and he's got a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline that he's going to be releasing soon, going over a lot of different attack vectors uh, for these deprecated protocols. So disabling SSL version one and two on your, on, on your web servers and then having your users make sure that when they're surfing the, these different sites that they're, they're making sure that they're not going to sites that have that in, enabled. And then uh, using strong encryption ciphers uh, for your web servers that are running SSL version three or TLS version one. If they're using a 56-bit key you know, that's a pretty, that's pretty weak encryption. And again, they, there's a lot of different things you can do to bypass that type of security. So strong encryption uh, ciphers on all your SSL traffic, um, anything basically 128 bit or, or better, uh, make sure that's all enabled. And again, weak passwords, stay away from weak passwords. Make them as long as possible. And then uh, using SSH instead of Telnet. Uh, Telnet's totally plain text, so if, if you have a network sniffer up, you can pretty much grab every username and password. And that, you'll see that a lot on, on Cisco equipment. People forget to uh, disable Telnet, and they'll just keep Telnet into into these, these Cisco routers. And you just, if you're an attacker and you've, and you've been able to compromise the network and, stay, and keep, your, keep your presence on the network, you can pretty much sniff for days and days and days and, and just pull passwords off the internet left and right. Or I'm sorry, off the internal network, left and right. Um, so firewalls can't block everything, because if they blocked everything, then you would never be able to get out to the internet. Um, so there is legitimate traffic, and there is, you know, people do need to be able to do their jobs, and they, and they need to be able to get to, you know, certain websites on the internet. But as far as, you know, this is kind of an attack on the Windows firewall. Um, you know, if it comes up every two seconds saying, well, this program needs to get out to the internet, uh, again, people are just going to click OK. Just, just make this thing work. Do whatever you can. Just keep clicking OK. Um, so if it's alerting people and it's giving them the option to override the, the firewall settings, then you might as well not have a firewall there in the first place because people are going to do whatever they can just to make the computer system work. Um, so this comes back down to an education issue. You have to educate your users. Um, you know, firewalls aren't, uh, aren't perfect, and, and, and humans are far from perfect. So um, the more you can educate your end users, the, the better chances of, uh, of, of stopping a compromise. Um, as far as um, staying anonymous on the internet, um, that's, that's almost impossible these days. There's a couple things you can do to stay anonymous, but it's a little bit outside the scope of you know, what we're talking about here. But firewalls will not provide any type of anonymous surfing for the internet. Um, whether it's your internet service provider or websites themselves, um, everybody pretty much tracks internet usage, how many people you know, click through every day. So um, you know, keep in mind that, you know, and it's not just the internet too. I mean, if, you, if anybody here has signed up for uh, Giant Eagle's Fuel Perks, they're tracking every single thing you bought from their store. So um, really, it isn't so much um, a privacy issue if, unless you're worried about, um, unless you're worried about you know, what people buy. But if you want to think about it a little bit differently, right after 9-11, um, the government went to a bunch of these companies who, uh, like Giant Eagle, and they, they requested to know everyone who's bought uh, certain ethnic foods 
because they wanted to be able to track all the Islamic people who have been uh, buying certain foods from their stores so that the government can track those people. Um, you know, the government will do anything they can to get information on you to track certain methods that you're, that you're using or different, you know, different things. Everybody's looking for information. Um, attackers are constantly looking to steal identities. Um, identity theft has been obviously on the rise. I'm sure everyone's heard all the commercials, you know, the LifeLock commercials and all these other commercials that are on TV. Um, and it's, it's almost become that people just don't really pay attention to that stuff anymore because they've heard it over and over and over, you know, all your identity stolen. Well, what are you going to do about it? But they never tell you what you can do to stop it from getting, from compromised. Um, I do use LifeLock. Uh, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's the best. I'm not gonna say it's the worst. But anything in in my mind is better than nothing. Um, and then there's malware that also looks into gathering information about its victims. So anything that you know, any type of malware that's got onto your computer system. Um, a lot of times they just search for you know trending. Uh, they they detect patterns and they send all that information back to the companies who've developed it. Um, but using a lot of these different methods and, and, com and compounding all these different hardening techniques on your computer system, you can dramatically sh slow down the amount of information that's leaving your network about you, telling other people, you know, you can advertise to this guy this way, you can advertise to this, this lady a different way. Um, if, if you're concerned about that type of privacy issue, then, you know, hardening techniques on your computer system are an absolute must. And then, um, I know I've been talking about firewalls all day with internet um, intrusion detection and, and intrusion prevention services, but I just can't stress that enough. Um, Komodo firewall with the proactive defense is, it's, I, I really enjoy it, but again, it takes a pretty, pretty decent knowledge level of how Windows works, uh, as I said earlier. Spybot search and destroy is also pretty good. Uh, it's more of a spyware, adware type scanner, but I don't really use it for that. I use it more for the T-Timer because it tells me a lot of things that are going on with the, the system registry. Um, any, any system that uh, touches the registry or tries to modify the registry in any way, shape, or form, the T-Timer is going to tell you about it. Um, so every patch Tuesday, my T-Timer goes off like crazy, and I'm you know, constantly tracking different um, registry changes. And some of them are kind of interesting to see, to see exactly what Microsoft changes with their, with their patch management cycles. So if you're interested in seeing some of the changes that are get rolled out every month, uh, you might want to just install this and just check out what's getting changed. Um, for, the, for the more business network uh, aspect of things, host intrusion prevention uh, services are becoming more prevalent. Uh, and it's good, too. Uh, the problem is, though, Cisco's actually end of life, it's uh, Cisco security agent. Um, so I'm guessing probably five years from now, it's really going to start pretty much being phased out everywhere. Um, the, the next best one that I've seen and been able to play with has been Trend Micro's deep security. Um, the problem with both of these is that they're really expensive. Um, for laptops and, and desktops, uh, general end user machines, you'll probably be getting uh, each license for about 25 bucks, which really isn't that bad. But when you start installing the host intrusion prevention services on servers, that's where it's going to really kill you. The licenses run anywhere from seven to eight hundred dollars a server. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but we have a lot of servers, uh, so it's kind of hard to just toss out twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars for the licensing for host intrusion prevention. Um, you really have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. It's a, it's a choice that you guys are going to have to look into to making. So with all the different things that you've probably heard on you know, radio or podcasts or um, if you guys love your Macs and um, you kind of buy into the whole go to Mac because you'll be fine. There's no viruses out there. There's no, you know, you're safe when you use a Mac. It's <laughs> coming from a Mac user. <laughs> um, the thing is, 
users are still going to receive you know, all the different threats that you're going to see with Windows-based computer systems. Um, Dave Kennedy's set can still get you when you use a Mac. Um, it, it comes down to end user awareness. Any system can be secure. It depends on who's running the system, though. Um, you can still get pop-up messages, malicious websites, malicious software. Um, it, case in point is um, a, a buddy of mine at work actually built a, uh, an installer package for uh, Ubuntu recently. It was a few months back. And if the end user installs this, they rootkit their own Ubuntu box. But it's not meant to be like, um, it's not meant to be run, it's a, it's a malicious file. But the idea is to prove that even if you switch everybody off of your Windows boxes just to go over to Linux because it's cheap, you still have the same problems. Because you, if, if the end user is allowing things to happen, you can still have the same exact problems that you're going to run into on Windows boxes. Um, and then getting into, uh, loosely getting into kind of the incident response for uh, Linux and Unix boxes is, you know, finding, finding good incident re response people to look at machines that have been compromised for Windows is hard enough. Trying to find them for, you know, uh, operating systems that aren't used as often, it's even harder. Um, so, it's kind of staying with the industry standard is just a, a, a basic good idea. Um, so, if people don't, and that's the other thing too, kind of going off the, the last sentence on the slide, if, uh, if people don't want to spend the time to learn how to use a Windows box, what makes you think they're going to make, they want to learn how to use a, a Linux or a Mac box any differently? You know, they just want it to work, they're just going to keep clicking yes no matter what. Um, internal penetrations, um, of all the penetrations that have happened at, at the corporate level, 70% of these penetrations have happened uh, due to employees working at the companies. Um, this is because employees have too much privilege. Um, there's no, this, the, the major thing in, that, we, that we've seen is that every system that we've been able to compromise has had um, end users with too much permissions, and that, that really means local administrator rights. Um, if you're logging in as the administrator on a box every single day, you're at a higher risk for some type of compromise than somebody who has limited rights on the box and is basically only able to run software. And that's really all you need to do. How often do you really, I mean, if you're installing software every single day, I can only imagine uh, how much software you have on your computer. I don't install software very often. Um, although I still have admin rights on my own box. Um, do as I say, not as I do. Um, file level restrictions, uh, it's also really important. Um, there's no reason for users to be able to modify uh, anything in the, in the Windows directory or really the program files, uh, especially program files in, in the Windows directories are the, probably the two biggest. Um, so if you can limit users from being able to do that type of thing, aka revoke local admin privileges, you're, you're actually really increasing the security at your end user systems. And then uh, lastly, especially in businesses, log everything. Um, we won't really get into getting syslog uh, servers running or anything like that, but um, that's kind of maybe another topic. Um, so why, we kind of touched on this earlier, why is antivirus software dead? It's because signature, it's all signature based. If there's not a signature to attack, uh, if there's not a signature out there to um, really get into finding why a certain piece of malware is, is malware as opposed to you know, a text file not being malicious, it's because there's no, there's no signature there to detect that. Um, and then all the kind of stuff I talked about before, um, why signatures are dumb. Um, between changing file names, some of these, some of these, um, some of these uh, signatures for antivirus software are so dumb that if you just change one letter in the file name, you can get around antivirus. Um, uh, kind of what I said earlier, as far as file headers and, and rootkits, and a big one that hardly anybody talks about is alternate data streams. Being able to hide data within files because uh, there's a fundamental flaw within. 
uh, NTFS, it basically allows you to hide a whole stream of data behind a file using alternate data streams. Um, I kind of wish I would have done a, a, some type of visual to, to express this, but because it's kind of hard to explain. But basically, you can hide a malicious executable within a text file, and then when you run the text file, it automatically runs the executable in the background without the user even knowing it. So if I email you, you know, a text file that's like five meg, and you open it up, it's one line of code. Well, you just probably compromised your computer system. Um, so why, why still have antivirus? It's, it comes back down to layering security. Um, again, I kind of already touched on this as far as uh, end users and administrator rights. Um, One reason why it's hard for uh, end users not to have administrator rights is because a lot of programmers don't really program applications as they're supposed to. They, they do it what's ever easiest for them so that they can they get the product out to the market faster. Um, so there's gotta be not only a, a, a fundamental change or shift in, in programming, but there also has to be the education for the end users as well. Um, and then again, going back to uh, programs like the T timer or the Komodo firewall. Um, if if you expect your, if, if you think that everybody should be running the software, then you know, kind of think of it as you know, how would your mother do? Uh, how would your mother do as far as um, you know, running the software? Your grandmother running the software? Because they're totally not going to understand what the hell a registry is, let alone you know why they should block a certain type of attack. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, go for it. Go for it. Um, essentially, yes. Uh, the the thing is, there's it's hard to find a good heuristics heuristics based AV software that works because. Even with the idea that there's heuristics built into AV software, it's still at least 75% signature based. You're still getting signatures from, you know, Kaspersky, Norton, whoever. But that is a good point to bring up. It is, you should be looking for uh, an AV system that has heuristics built into it as opposed to being 100% signature driven. So that's a good point. No, that's, that's you're good. That, that's true. It, it comes down a lot to logging. Um, but going back to what you said earlier, um, unfortunately, the, the corporate antivirus I've seen has, has generally been worse than the home-based versions. And the reason why is because when you get in corporate antivirus, you're really just getting straight antivirus. But if you go out and you get you know, Kaspersky's uh, you know, three-user end license, uh, you're, you're getting not only antivirus, but you're getting an, a proactive firewall you're also getting email scanning. You're also getting all these other options that come with the home version that you won't get with your business versions. But uh, if you want to go back to the business scenario, you're not going to go around installing that on every single one of your end user machines. It'd take you forever. So. That's why I think it's important to add other technology other than Android. Right. Absolutely. And that, and that goes really back to layering security. Um, one, one thing isn't going to fix everything. There's, there's, it's just impossible. Let, it's, we can't, uh, no more questions? Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs>